We're in a series, uh, I Will, a series that is basically based upon the aspect that, that uh, we need to move. We need to be in action. We need, we need to be uh, in the situation where we're willing, as, as uh, uh, William put it so well last week, to serve, to be an attitude of Jesus. Uh, I mentioned to the Sunday School class this morning that I really liked his basin theology last week, and that, 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 that was good, to where, you know, there's two basins, uh, and that is one uh, that Pilate had, and he washed his hands of Jesus, and says, you know, I, I'm washing my hands of the whole thing. But then there's the one that Jesus used when he dipped into that basin to wash the disciples' feet. And one or, one or the other is going to be where we're at. You may, may not realize it, but we uh, are either washing in one basin or the other. Uh, Jesus gave us the example. And uh, that example is not unlike in our text or in our chapter today as we go to the next one called I Will Go. Uh, it's not unlike the helicopter pilot that I read about uh, that uh, was in Vietnam, true story, and he would drop a Huey helicopter into landing zones that were barely big enough, and, and he usually was under fire, and so he, but he did it to get these wounded soldiers off the battlefield and, and back to a mass unit to where they could be tended to and even saved. And he took bloody, shot-up kids strapped to the sides of a helicopter. He hauled them all day long, and it, it was a max mission or in a helicopter to rescue them. Now here's my question. What if those who served in that units, and those units, those decided that we're not going to go out onto the battlefield? And if they decided that it would be safer and it would be more comfortable just to remain back at base, and, of course, this is just a the theoretical question because they were in the military. They didn't have any choice. But putting it into in category, if they had a choice and they decided not to go, uh, what if they did not go and rescue those soldiers off the battlefield? The soldiers would die. That's just the bottom line. They, if, not, if they were not rescued, they would die. What happens to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ when it stops operating as it was designed to operate? The same thing as what happens to the helicopter pilots who considered their mission to rescue wounded people decide instead to stay in the coffee shop and, or, and talk and, and talk about all the great flights they had in the past and no longer carried out their mission. People will die. People are wounded. Sin wounds us. And sin will kill us and give us uh, an aspect to where we have no hope. Jesus' Great Commission really is the mission. It's, it's why the church was established. And it's given authority from the Supreme Commander. And it's to be a driving force of why a church exists. It's found over the 28th chapter of Matthew, down at the 18th verse, and 18th to 20th verse. We've heard it before. We've heard it in this series before. But yet, it's something that we should never forget, never let go away from our purpose for being. And it says this, Then Jesus said to them, and he started with this, and that's all important because we know that it's not our authority, it's not the authority of any human institution, it's not the authority, it isn't, it isn't the, just the idea of mankind, it's God. And specifically Jesus Christ who has established this commission. So he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And the reason why I started that is because he's about to commission the church as to why we exist. And so therefore, since I have this all authority, I'm commissioning you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I am surely with you. Uh, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And we're not there yet. 
The end of the age is the end of this age, the end of the church age, the end of the world age. Now the one who gave the church this order modeled our mission before he gave his commission. He modeled it himself. Over in Luke 19.10, it says that Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and to save the lost. He said, my purpose for coming is very, very simple. I've come to seek and to save the lost. And so I guess it's urgently important that those who claim to be His disciples, those who claim to be His church, answer a very vital question. First of all, do we really believe in our hearts? Do we honestly and really believe that those who are not Christians are lost? Believe it or not, there are churches that exist today that would answer that they believe there are those who are not lost who are not Christians. Or, yeah, I think I said that right. If we don't answer this question first, there's really no point in going any further in this message or in this book or in this, in this process as a church. If we do not believe the Word of God is the Word of God, and we do not believe that what the Word of God says is those who are outside of Christ are lost, then our purpose has to change. Uh, it's no longer the Great Commission that we follow. You see, we live in a world that continually says, don't claim your way is the only way, and don't impose your beliefs upon me if, about Christ. The world hates Christianity as a general rule. The Satan's made that clear, and he's made that inside. The Satan, and Scripture says Satan owns the world. He is the prince of this earth. And so the world hates those who are seeking to rescue spiritually wounded people. Why? Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 22, All men hate me, because, and all men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Remember what Jesus told his disciples in the upper room during that last supper and that one we hear, usually around funeral times, but it's, it, it shouldn't be just reserved to that. Because these, these young men just heard Jesus is going to die. And it really started to penetrate. And they were greatly troubled because they realized they're going to lose Jesus. What are they going to do next? We can't lose him. And he said to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. And trust also in me. And then he says, in my Father's house are many. We like to use mansions out of the King James because we'd rather have a mansion than a room. Let's be honest. You know, I mean, that sounds better. But anyway, it's, it's actually places. <laughs> if you really want to break down to the language, the, the word is, the, there's, place, there's a place for you. There's a place for us. Sounds like a song in a musical. Anyway, so in the Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And so I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And so if I go to prepare, because they're thinking he's going, he's gone, he won't be back. It's going to be, it's going to be hard. It's going to be ridiculous. We're not going to be able to handle this. But he says, if I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I'll come back and take you to my, to, with me, that you may also be where I am. And then he said, and you know, they should have, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. I imagine all of them, but only one of them spoke up, but I imagine all of them kind of thought, what? What's he saying? Thomas we, we've given him a bad rap through the years because of, you know, the problems after the resurrection of him not being there to see Jesus. But Thomas, one of those disciples, I, I think a world of Thomas. I think he's a great man and a great thinker and he's honest and he's, I mean, I, I give him a lot of credit. But anyway, he was one of the disciples that had doubts. And anyway, Lord, we don't know where you're going. We, how, how can we know the way? And Jesus' response leaves no doubt about how Thomas and every person in the world should understand the way, the only way. Jesus said in that sixth verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he could have stopped there, but he goes on. No one, and he didn't clarify that. He didn't clarify that. 
He made it absolute. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. That's the question. Do we really believe Jesus is the only way? The only way to salvation? The only way to heaven? Because that's a very small gate, and that's a really narrow road. But it is the way Jesus himself laid out for those in this world in order to be saved. Do we really believe that a world without Jesus Christ is a lost world? And if we who claim to be disciples aren't urgently seeking and rescuing people morally wounded in our battlefield on earth, we need to ask, why not? Why not? I think also we need to, to uh, ask because we've allowed excuses to, to smother our conviction. Uh, Tom Rayner in his book, I Will, that, that you should be reading, in this chapter lists five excuses we offer ourselves of why, why we aren't rescuing. Why, why aren't we getting in the helicopters and going? First of all, and this has got to be personal. This is a personal thing. This is not just a, a you know, this is a responsibility of the church, and, and I know there's people who take care of that. This is personal. You. Some would say, this is not my spiritual gift. Really? You think you are not spiritually gifted in evangelism? So you decide that you can leave that to somebody who is spiritually gifted in evangelism. Think about the logical inconsistency of that, though. Would you say that those who do not have the gift of mercy should never show mercy? Of course not. Do you think that the person who does not have the gift of, of giving should never give? Not according to the Scriptures. Everyone is called to be obedient to the Great Commission. That includes me. That includes you. There is really no good excuse for it. But some will say, well, I, I, I can't do it. I, I don't have that gift. Other excuse would be that is what we pay our preachers and church staff to do. Again, Tom Rainer's listed these out for us. I hope you read that. But we live in a world of specialization. I guarantee you, if you go to a, a I don't even know if there is a general doctor now, is there? I mean, they're all kind of somewhat special. I mean, but you go to your, your family practitioner or family doctor, and they'll say, okay, I think this is what's wrong. I'm going to send you to so-and-so. That's, that's the way it works now. You know, these old country doctors, they treated you, you know. Take this and go home. Uh, but, uh, you know, we live in a day of specialization. We really do. And, and uh, we see that if, if you have a problem with your new car, I'm talking new car, you're probably not going to take it to the shade tree mechanic who lives down the street, are you? And it, probably that shade tree mechanic is not going to know what to do with it. And if they do, they don't have the equipment. They don't have the diagnostic equipment to deal with it. It's a very specialized thing now. And so since every aspect of our lives seems to be specialized, so many think that the church is the same way. We pay our preachers, we pay, we pay staff, we pay people who are specialists at this, and they are the ones that need to be doing the evangelistic work of the church. But you would be hard-pressed to find that idea in Scripture anywhere because it's not there. Another excuse, I don't have time. I just don't have time. If we don't make time to share the love of Christ, it really is not a priority in our lives. It's a simple question. Is there anything more important than salvation? Is there anything more important than someone having a relationship with Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Do we really realize how important that is? If you agree that nothing is more important, how can we not have time? The fact is, we use our time how we feel it should be managed, and we always will be based upon what our priorities are, what our wants are, what we think is important. A fourth one he put in there is, I don't want to impose my beliefs on others. I don't want to impose my beliefs on others. We <laughs> had a, had a uh, grandma bring her granddaughter from the very first church I served in years and years ago, and every Sunday... Uh, she would uh, 
bring his granddaughter to church. Well, she passed away, and so the granddaughter didn't come because grandma didn't come. And so I went out to visit the family, and uh, they were they were gracious. I'm not going to say they weren't, but uh, the father made it very clear and says, uh, you know, uh, we don't believe that way. And I said, well, yeah, but your, your granddaughter, we'll, we'll pick her up. She's been coming with Grandma, and you've, you've not objected to that and everything. And he says, I, I just don't think you ought to impose your beliefs on her. Let her make up her own mind. I mean, we're talking about, I'm thinking seven at that point, you know. Uh, let her make up her own mind. Don't, don't try to push your beliefs on her. And uh, they wouldn't let her come back to church. And that's a sad situation. And... Uh, not impose my beliefs. Can, this is this is a bothersome thing to say. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul standing before a crowd and saying, "I really have good news for you, but I really don't want to impose it, my beliefs on you. I'll just keep my beliefs to myself. After all, religion is really a private matter." Can you imagine the Apostle Paul doing that? In fact, that's just the opposite of what he did. Of course not. It was if it wasn't for the boldness of Paul. And the other workers in the first century church to stand up and proclaim the truth and the message of the Lord Jesus Christ and tell people about Jesus. That was really all they needed to do, just tell people about Jesus. You can't force a person to accept Jesus. You can't force a person to, to accept your beliefs. But you can share. You can tell. But if they hadn't have done it, we would not be sitting here today. The church would not exist today if these people weren't bold enough to share the gospel. When the gospel is shared boldly and joyfully, it isn't imposing our beliefs upon others, but giving others the opportunity to hear a message that they can then choose or not choose to accept. We're merely sowers of the seed according to the scriptures. That's all we do is sow seed. We can't make the grow, but we can sow, we can water, but God gives the increase. It's up to them to accept or reject the seed and the salvation that's offered. And then the fifth one he mentioned is, is well, you know, I'm, I'm bashful, I'm quiet, I'm an introvert. Let me confess something to you. I technically am an introvert. Uh, and my personality does not lend itself naturally to evangelism, if you will. So I look and see where I might have an opportunity to share the gospel, but I'm an introvert, so I just don't blatantly, openly, like some... I couldn't be like... I have a, had a grandpa. Now, he was, he was different, and I don't want to get into that. Uh, I mean, really, really different. But... Um, he did, he did hit his head at one time, and so, and, and Mom told me this, said well, after he hit his head he was different. That's true. This is a true story. But he became a self-proclaimed preacher that preached really odd stuff. And he would go up in Chicago, and he'd stand on the street corner, and he would condemn everybody to hell. I mean, on the street corner of Chicago. I mean, he was, he was that bold, and he would, he would say, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. I mean, didn't know him from Adam, you know. But he, he condemned everybody to hell, which I don't agree with, by the way. I don't, but, uh, you know, he did do it. But we see that, that uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not all bad being an introvert. Uh, because at least it gives us opportunity to think about who and what we need to share with other people. Uh, that was a kind of an extrovert why I told that little story that, that didn't do any good. Uh, but we see, it's been, to me, it's been incredible to see how if you look for it, God opens doors when you simply ask for opportunities to share. And those opportunities fit an introvert personality. Uh, it's a, introversion is an inward focus, and it's not a valid excuse, but we see that it can be dealt with. And here's the truth. We do what we want to do and what's really important to us, period, whether we're introvert or extrovert. So how do we reach a, a place where we can get into the category of saying, I will go, I will do? How do we become real disciples of Jesus who are obedient to His commission? Well, I think we need to move from theory to action. 
Theory is nice. That's what we're dealing with here is theory. We haven't put it into action yet. But this is theory. When we talk about it, we present it. If we really believe that Christ is the only way to salvation, the only way someone can come to Him is by hearing the gospel message, then we better stop practicing in theory Christianity and then put it into action to those who need to hear. Jesus said in Mark 8.38, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in, in this adulterous and sinful generation, I guess every generation must have been adulterous and sinful because it just never has changed. But in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of Him when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. For if anyone is ashamed of me, and by the way, we're ashamed of Jesus if we're unwilling to share Him, if we're unwilling to talk about Him. We're unwilling to, to tell somebody, you know, what you believe about Him. 2,000 years ago, Peter and John were thrown into prison on their crime because they were in prison. They were talking about Jesus. That was it. That was their crime. They were talking about Jesus. They were telling people what they thought and what they believed about Jesus. And we see that when they are escorted before the judges, who was the Jewish Sanhedrin at that time, after hearing their defense, they decided, you know, we don't really have enough to hold you. So we're going to let you go. But do not speak about this Jesus. We don't hear you about the, you're going out there and you're talking about Jesus. We don't want to hear it. So we're going to let you go, but quit talking about Jesus. Peter and John had an answer. Before they ever, um, immediate answer, over in Acts 4, 19 and 20, is, is they gave their answer. But Peter and John replied, Okay, you judges, judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we can not help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't, we can't help it. We, we have to talk about Jesus. They couldn't stop speaking any more about Jesus than they could breathe. Far too many people won't even start speaking about Him. And we see people will let the human physical elements overpower their spiritual and, and not be like these young men. I'm afraid I will be rejected if I put myself out there. I'm afraid somebody's going to think something bad about me. I doubt in this country and where we live and who we are that we're afraid somebody's going to shoot us for it. Now, it could happen. Crazy world we live in. But really, that's not what we're afraid of. We're afraid what people are going to think. I don't want to be persecuted for what I believe. So let's summarize this lesson. How do we move from theory to action? I think first of all, as again, the book shares with us, we need to pray for opportunities. We need to pray for opportunities. It's simple. Either we believe God answers or we don't. Our prayers. We don't have opportunities for two reasons. If we don't see them, we don't ask for them. Or we're too busy with our own pursuits to even see them when they come. Always remember, God will respond if we ask Him to give us opportunities. But He will. Second, simply invite people to church. You don't have to. I mean, we've read that in the book, and and we don't we don't have to, you know, have this big theological discussion. We don't have to have all the answers. It can just simply be. Come and try it. Come and try it. If it's not your thing, okay. I mean, you know, no pressure. But come and and or a small group. You know, come come and try it. And and I shared that with you before. And then also intentionally look for opportunities. We are spiritually alert, and when we're spiritually alert, we'll be watching all the time for opportunities. And amazingly, we will see them daily, guaranteed. And then also be prepared to share when the opportunities do come. All we need to do to share our testimony about how God called you is to share your story. I believe this because. Do you know why you're here today? you know why you're Christian today? you know why... You believe what you believe? 
Again, no deep theological discussion needed here. Just simply, I believe because. Ask other mature believers to help you to, to prepare for, to meet others. Ask questions in your small groups, whatever it may be. Share the opportunities. Have others pray for you. You, you may be afraid, and you may, it may be outside of your comfort zone, but there, that's where faith is. And it's impossible to please God without faith, according to Hebrews 11.6. Sure, sharing our faith means that we sometimes may get hurt. We're putting ourselves out there. Talking about Jesus may bring about rejection, and it will hurt. But the famous Christian writer C.S. Lewis wrote in his book of, called The Four Loves this, To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around your hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will, be not, it will be not a broken heart. It will actually become unbreakable, unimpenetrable, and irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of loving others is in hell. Unquote. Satan loves it. He loves it when we be silent. He loves it when we refuse to go. He loves it when we refuse to share with other people. It's time for His people, His redeemed, His saved, to be unashamed of our Redeemer and willing to say, I will go and share the gospel. It's our commission. It's our commission as a church. It's our commission as individuals. Be not ashamed of Jesus Christ. We have an invitation hymn. An invitation hymn was written by an individual that had problems of being able to share with others. The very thing we're talking about today. And turning that completely over to the Lord, he wrote this song. And this song really says it all. And the response, it was just tremendous. He, he no longer was ashamed. He no longer was afraid. He no longer was unwilling to, to uh, open his heart and his mind because it was really a blessing that came to him instead of the pain and the hurt and sorrow because he, he allowed God to come in and work through him. So he wrote this hymn. Let's stand as we sing. I'll go where you want me to go. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, Carson and I would like to thank you all for all the prayers and the cards and the messages that you've given us over the last nine months. Um, um, <clears throat> Over the last several months, it became apparent uh, just how severe Mary's injury was. Um, she had, of course, no sensation at all from her neck down, and uh, atrophy became a terrible problem, uh, particularly to her heart and her lungs. Um, her blood pressure would spike in the morning to 200 over 150 and then down to 50 over 35, at which point she'd lose her vision and pass out. Uh, medication could stabilize her, but um, <clears throat> she, it was very difficult for her. She was always thankful and always gracious and loving. Um, 
on the good side, uh, all our prayers were answered. Her faith grew and grew over the months. Um, she understood that she was going home. Um, so, in the final conversations we had with her, we couldn't come away, but happy. Uh, she was she was a wonderful lady to the point that uh, on the morning of the day she left us, she told my oldest brother, I feel the way I used to feel on the morning when I was getting ready to go to summer camp. She was anticipating great joy. And um, <laughs> I'll try and get through this song. I wasn't able to at home, but maybe you'll give me strength. <laughs> it really describes her thoughts over the last several months.
Yeah, he, he's tapping me all the time, to be honest with you. He, 